Dan and Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. And thanks, Sarah. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Hi, Sarah. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, as, as Lori mentioned, um, both Sarah and I have a bit of a history with the place. Um, I was working on a few different projects with Sarah uh, back uh, in 2015, including the, the exhibition uh, called um, uh, Beyond the Surface that featured work by Sarah. And we're going to look at some, uh, some images from that in a moment. But I thought um, that first I would actually start uh, with um, talking a little bit about um, the, um, well, the topic of the, of the talk this evening. Can everyone see my um, slideshow? Sarah, can you see my slideshow? Yep. Yes. Um, and um, uh, specifically talk about um, a, a bit about the history of the forum exhibition series uh, and also um, uh, a little bit about what it's been like to work at, at a museum uh, in the midst of this pandemic uh, and the ways in which we've all had to adjust. Um, and then um, we can uh, hopefully look at some work, some new work by Sarah and some work in progress by Sarah um, that will be featured in the exhibition. And we'll talk a little bit more about the concept for that. Um, so what you're seeing on the screen here are a couple installation views from a, uh, a, a version of the forum or an installation in the forum series by an artist named Ian Chang. And this was a, a, an incredibly um, a technologically advanced installation which featured a uh, software that was um, uh, adaptive and evolutionary. And um, you're seeing it both during the daytime uh, uh, front and center on the left and um, and then on the right you're seeing a view of the kind of main entryway into the forum gallery from uh, the museum's sculpture court and and I include that image because I think it's important to um, to set the stage a little bit for where exactly this show is happening at the museum um, the forum gallery is it's really our our uh, landmark contemporary art space um, that is situated along this um, kind of central thoroughfare. And I'll use my cursor here to just highlight. Um, uh, here is our museum shop. Uh, just to the right off screen from the shop is our ticketing desk. And so uh, anyone coming into the museum uh, from any entrance, we have an upper entrance as well as a lower entrance, um, uh, and proceeding up the stairs to purchase their tickets or go to the shop or go to the cafe, which is also adjacent, um, is, is met by contemporary art. And uh, this also includes uh, visitors who might normally not go up the stairs to the right, which, uh, which is where the, uh, the bulk of the Museum of Art galleries are. But many are, uh, visitors are continuing to the left, heading this direction, which is where the Museum of Natural History is. And, and the Carnegie is kind of a unique institution in that we have two museums co-located within this building in the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh, which, uh, which, which are the Museum of Art and the Museum of Natural History. And so uh, even uh, families who are fully intending to just go and see dinosaur bones uh, still get a taste of contemporary art, whether they like it or not. And, um, and this is really important because I think in contemporary art can, can be challenging um, and it can um, require a lot of, of looking and thinking. Um, and uh, it's certainly not um, maybe kid friendly in the way that dinosaur bones are, but, but we feel like uh, it's, it's significant that we um, expose all of our audiences to, to these new ideas because um, artists are really uh, helping us shape and frame the way that we look at the world. And, um, and I think we've got, we, we have to recognize that and, and recognize how special that is and value that just as much as, as maybe some of the more entertainment based aspects of museums. And, um, 
uh, the, just to be, give you a bit about the history of the exhibition series itself, it dates back all the way to 1992, sorry, 1994, um, uh, with the first installation being Jeff Walt. So there's actually a long tradition of photography being featured in this gallery. And um, it, it often is uh, younger artists or artists who are um, who have created new bodies of work um, that we are very excited to present and um, and they are things that sometimes are bound within the gallery sometimes they spill outside of this gallery um, but for the most part it's um, it's a space that it, as the name would imply is really intended to be open and accessible to anyone so in fact you don't need to even buy a ticket um, to see uh, the forum exhibitions um, you, they are free uh, for anyone who, who is simply inside the building. As Lori mentioned, um, the, uh, uh, one of the other projects that I worked on is the Dina Lawson exhibition, which happened in this space. Um, and uh, I'm showing this in part, again, to give you a sense of the, the architecture of the space. And so here on the right, you can see uh, this is the a Solowit mural that was created for the Carnegie International, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and these stairs uh, head up to uh, the main galleries for the Museum of Art. Um, and, um, and I also show this um, to give you a sense of uh, scale, um, specifically in relationship to photographs. Um, these were uh, new photographs that Dina created for this um, uh, exhibition, and they were her largest ever printed. So they roughly range from about 40 to 40 by 60 inches. So, you know, these are these are five feet tall, almost life size, essentially. Um, and and I think um, the 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 height of the ceilings, which I believe is about 20 feet, really um, uh, give us a chance to show larger scale installations or work that um, even if it's wall based um, uh, might be uh, something where, where you need to step back in order to really see it. And then lastly, I'll show um, the um, the most uh, uh, one of the most recent installations in this space, which was a work by Lenka Clayton and John Rubin called Fruit and Other Things, which was part of our Carnegie International, uh, which ran from 2018 to 2019. And um, this is a brilliant installation um, here on the left image. You're seeing this is a stack of blank paper. And uh, this is actually John here and Lenka here, um, but they were not in the exhibition space for the entire run of the exhibition. They actually hired uh, artists and sign painters to come and paint the title of approximately 10,000 uh, works that were rejected for the Carnegie International. Uh, in the archive, we keep meticulous records as to the names and artists of every piece ever considered for uh, for inclusion in the exhibition, and um, and Lenka and John decided to to create a, a an archive of these titles, and um, the the titles were painted on single uh, sheets of board, and uh, then placed in these frames that were also drying racks, and once dry, visitors could come in and take a um, uh, one of the paintings home with its own certificate of authenticity. So uh, another way that I think um, uh, the, these exhibitions um, have, have broken beyond the walls of the, even the, not just the gallery, but the museum itself. Um, and, and I think that that kind of um, uh, interrelation or that, that um, connection to people is so critical to this space. Um, you know, it's not, it's something like I mentioned where people might just be walking past going somewhere else. And so we, we, just, we think long and hard about, uh, in conjunction with artists, about, you know, what we can do to really stop, uh, invite people in and begin a dialogue. Um, and, um, and so that really um, brings us to, um, to Sarah. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah because I'm, I just, I'm tired of talking, but also um, <laughs> because, um, you know, it's important to hear, as I mentioned, from artists. But um, just to quickly set up um, uh, the show that, that did happen at PPAC back in 2015, um, these were three artists who I had met 
um, actually through some uh, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council studio visits and just personal connections, and um, and I, I realized that uh, they were they were doing um, uh, different things, but working in ways that really exploded the traditional two dimensional frame of uh, of a photograph. And um, and Sarah's work in particular, I love for its materiality. Um, um, she's always experimenting with with new materials uh, and new media, which which we'll talk about. Um, and um, and the way in which she layers them, I think, are really beautiful. So um, I'll sort of circle the group of Sarah's images here. Um, but um, you're seeing plexiglass with acetates and other plastics um, layered on top of one another um, and, and creating these, I think these really, um, uh, even though they're flat, these often very deep um, uh, compositions. And um, uh, here's another example of one here and a, and a second one here, um, which also feature um, painted elements. So, um, you know, I think to say to call Sarah just a photographer um, is 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 certainly an understatement, and and I'm I'm hoping that we can talk uh, more about the again the materiality and some of the process behind not just this work but but the work that's currently in, in progress. Um, and then we were um, excited to show um, these uh, uh, sculptures, photographic sculptures. They were three D printed ceramic ties, uh, neckties, and. Um, uh, I think um, the the imagery that Sarah draws on, uh, including here's microphones here, thinking about stand up and comedy and television and, and media in general, um, and also um, gender and gender roles. Um, I think there's a lot wrapped up uh, in the imagery of this work. And again, I think we'll, we'll probably talk about that um, in a moment. Um, here's an example of... Uh, uh, an image with a urinal here. Um, I should say these, this is David Kenny Cutler's work here, and this is Ethan's work here. I should have been mentioning that all along, but hopefully you can get a feel for it. Um, and then that brings us here up to the present. Um, Sarah's exhibition is currently slated for um, end of summer, early fall of 2021. And um, Sarah, why don't you just talk a little bit about, I don't know, you, I, wherever you want to talk, you start and I can go back to images if you want or whatever you like. Okay, thank you so much. And thanks for that um, overview. Thanks for having us this evening to everyone at PPAC, um, virtually, albeit. And um, it's, I've turned off the participants list, but it's really nice to see so many um, known, friendly and dear uh, names and, and some faces in the audience, even though for some reason, it's really different on Zoom than in person and and I have to push that away to look at the screen. I have but, to um, my mom and dad too. <laughs> I, I see that they're on here. <laughs> my mom, my dad. Hi, hi. <laughs> okay. Um yeah and hi hi to everyone's parents, everyone's <laughs> children. Um it's yeah uh we're all beaming into each other's homes. It's very it's moving actually. Um so I guess to just go back to a little bit of what Dan was saying um uh, one, it's very nice to be at a point where there's long relationships with people, with institutions, um, with places, and to be revisiting those. And so um, not only is it meaningful to be preparing for a show at the Carnegie to work with Dan again, but also, um, you know, I was just thinking about the first time that I encountered that gallery, the Forum Gallery, which I didn't know was called the Forum Gallery until... Um, uh, Dan told me maybe uh, two years ago. And um, the first time I ever went to the museum was for the International that was in 2013. I don't know the number, um, but it was curated by um, Dan Byers and Tina Kukelski and Daniel Bauman. Um, and in this gallery, the gallery um, that we're working on, there was a just stunning Erica Verazzuti uh, sculpture installation. Um, and it was the first time I had seen her work and it was just really incredible. I just remember um, that. And I also remember 
going through the museum that night during the opening and making it, I don't know if it's called the Great Hall or what it's called, but to the sort of Nicole Eisenman retrospective and um, other contemporary art uh, exhibitions that were sort of embedded in the natural history side of the museum. Um, I was also able to go and see the most recent international um, for my second trip to the museum or maybe third, I can't remember, but, um, but uh, yeah, so it's really nice to have a relationship with the space when so often the work can be site specific and related to architecture. Um, so just to focus a little bit on what we're looking at on this screen, um, this is a, a 60 inch pearl um, kiln that's downtown Brooklyn and Irvin Glass. Um, it's kiln number seven, but I think it's also called Terry. <laughs> um, and this is something that I made uh, earlier in the fall before I actually stopped going to uh, Urban Glass because the numbers in Brooklyn started going up in terms of COVID. And just to sort of talk about one of our intended discussion points, which is what it's like to make an exhibition right now um, there's sort of the macro, which is questions that Dan as a curator has been asking, such as like, you know, why this show now, why there, um, what's the, you know, the big idea and what's meaningful about it. Um, also the macro, like, especially living here in Brooklyn, I'm so reliant on a community and so reliant on shared resources that just become a totally different thing when it becomes COVID. So, um, so this was earlier in the fall, as I said, and this is basically um, a test. Uh, it's some off cuts from some white glass that I'm working on to make this big mural piece for the show. And I wanted to see how it fired. And I also just wanted to not waste that material. Um, so that's what this is. And it's a tape measure and it's a triptych that unfolds. Um, yeah, so that's, it's not even mounted or ready to go. That's just in the floor of my studio. I think all of the images are really work in progress. Um, and just to maybe zoom out a little bit, the exhibition we're working on is um, thinking about like museological care and senses, um, the sensory touch, um, there's a few other kind of themes that are coming out, um, but I think one of the, the main elements are that I'm working with photographs sort of embedded in glass. Um, they're sort of like dumb touch screens in some levels, they're, they're architecture in some levels, they're, you know, I don't really know fully what, what they all, what they are, but working with imagery um, in glass and, a good example of sort of how that evolved is, you know, in all of the, the um, images from the show with Dave and Ethan, you know, one of the connective tissues for all three of us was that we were kind of working in, um, in a lot of plastic and making objects out of images, image objects, um, et cetera. And that's um, sort of still going on. I'm, I, I jumped from plastic to glass um, a few years ago. Uh, I think, who knows why really, but I think I had it in my brain for a few years and then I finally just did it. And it's sort of like um, blackjack, you know, it's just like you're, you get kind of addicted and you just are like, hit me, hit me, hit me all the time because it's a really different process. You go in that kiln and it takes 24 hours to come out at the least to see what's going to come out. And, um, and it's just a really, I don't know, it's a really different relationship with the materials than if I'm just kind of like jamming in my studio, um, making things. So, um, yeah, I don't know what maybe, yeah. So these are some studio shots of work in process. Um, what's on the wall are images of palettes um, that are like testers from the, sorry, from the store uh, Sephora. And um, 
I took these pictures actually just on my iPhone um, in late February. Uh, and I didn't really know what I was doing at the time, but my idea was, okay, take these on the, on the phone and then go back when you, you go back and photograph them with the proper camera. I was sort of interested in the color um, arrays and how they're just, you know, culturally determined. I was sort of interested in the fact that people were touching them and sort of making them unpristine, making them interacted and swiped with, you know, in the same way that, you know, a phone might be, or, or just all of these things that are seemingly perfect or pristine that just get kind of handled. Um, so I was really interested in that handling and the, the anonymous like collectivism of it. And then um, it was probably like two days after I took these pictures that I was like, oh yeah, that's going away. That's never going to be a thing again. Um, you know, it was probably like March 2nd that here in New York, at least we started to realize that it was really um, getting hectic with the pandemic. And, um, you know, I didn't make it to a Sephora with a proper, you know, I had like a Hasselblad on hand and I was getting all geared up and I didn't make it before they shut down. And um, I don't, you know, it just kind of dawned on me that people aren't going to be collectively putting their hands in things and touching their face really probably ever again. Um, and that's just sort of like a dumb observation, but um, anyway, so I started printing these out in the later spring um, and they are getting incorporated into, I'm not sure if you have images of, yeah, into these, these are actually finished works. Um, these are glass kind of pockets and the photographs are paper photographs printed and mounted and um, like slotted in um, to the, the glass um, sort of enclosure. Uh, can, I don't, Sarah, can I interrupt you really quick? Yes, please. Um, no, no, no. I think because you, you've already raised so much and, and, um, and so much of what you're talking about is, is, has filtered into our discussions and conversations around this project. And um, to go back a little bit and talk about the glass and that kind of um, the idea of a touch screen. Um, I remember that when, um, when we first started, when I first started asking you about glass, you specifically mentioned, you know, iPhones or smartphones as being um, essentially just a sheet of glass with light behind it. Um, and yet at the same time, there are these incredibly powerful tools um, and, and we still interact with them by just smudging that glass in some way. Um, can you, can you talk um, about that, that sort of the, uh, maybe the more conceptual side of glass as a, as a medium? Yeah, um, there's a few things. I mean, one, on the one hand, there's, yeah, it's relationship to this thing, which is just, you know, um, a piece of glass with pictures on it that I'm like touching and, and interacting with all day long. Um, and then also relating to, um, you know, for a while with the plastic, I've been making like both images that are objects so that they would ha they would feel like the images had a weight more than like just a fleeting thing, especially as so many images populate the globe. Um, also the fact that there's, so, you know, starting with transparency in the glass. So um, the idea of not having an opaque thing, something that you could see through so that, um, it wasn't so much, you know, a break from reality, but interacting with reality. Um, and then not so much in these pieces that are up on the screen, but some of the other glass pieces, like, um, you know, a lot of my work and career has been really trying to see how far I can damage an image as like a, not necessarily a strategy, but like a stand in for something else. Um, until it will break, you know, I'm not going for abstraction. I'm, I'm really going for a kind of action on the image. And that's one of the things about glass because of its alchemical, uh, you know, the, 
the properties, um, you're, it's basically like a solid, you're melting it into an ooey gooey, I don't know, it's not really a liquid, but like a gel, you know, and then, and then you're cooling it back into a solid. And in so doing, something happens, it merges together, it, you know, falls in a way that it'll fall, you can control it in certain ways. And I'm not doing like glass blowing at all. This is all done in a kiln, like you saw, and like one would do ceramics. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I think that that metamorphosis um, and deformation and reformation is like pretty important. And it's sort of just another thing that I've been doing kind of with all my work throughout. And I think um, just for, for just to clarify, um, so the process here um, is that you are, you're printing photographs or you're, at a, you're sending photographs out to be printed at a, a, a specific specialized printer who prints in powdered glass, right? Yeah. And it, it, um, it translates into like, basically just looks like a paper print, but um, so the technology is sort of, it's a retrofitted old, um, it's a retrofitted copy machine. So if anyone's ever worked at an office and you know that both like the toner of a copy machine is like a powder that's in a drum that, you know, you shake and then you put in, um, instead of the toner powder, it's glass powder. And then if you've ever gotten a copy, a piece of paper right out of a copier, this is an old, like, like a laser copy or not inkjet, um, it's like warm. And so what happens is it seals it, it heat seals it onto the paper. And then when you put it in the kiln, the paper burns off and the powdered glass melts and fuses into the rest of the glass, transferring the image um, onto the glass. I think that's the easiest way to explain it. Yeah, and, and so that's that's slightly different from these, where these are actually um, photographs of the makeup testers at Sephora on paper, and they are inserted into, slid into these glass pockets yeah. that you've created. And I think, um, you know, one of the big uh, themes that we've been talking a lot about um, is is this idea of touch and uh, and contact. And as you said, I mean, certain elements of our life are gone and probably never coming back again, um, including the idea of, you know, communal makeup testers. And, um, but, but we are still, you know, at, at our basic human level, we are, we are creatures of touch. We rely on human touch and, and this notion of, of care and, and maybe even caress um, is, is something that, I think is really important that we try to kind of express to our visitors um, and maybe um, uh, um, that, that even just the notion of a pocket, like, you know, cradling these photographs is um, it's a, it's kind of a loaded gesture. And, um, and maybe, you know, could you talk a little bit more about that? And maybe I can ad advance to a, another image. Yeah. Here. yeah. Oh, this is a test. I don't know what's happening with it. Maybe people can tell me if they dig it or not. Um, I, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, for the record, I don't care about makeup testers. Like that's not what I actually care about. It was just like a notion. Um, and one place that I'm going a lot with this, um, which I wasn't expecting when we first started talking, like really, really talking about what was going to happen um, is, and I think I, you know, I told you about this pretty recently um, is thinking just a lot about department stores. And I think part of it is because I, um, I started, I am going down this like research hole about um, now I'm the Kaufman's uh, of Pittsburgh and, and they were the commissioners of falling water and thinking about this really specific um, sort of history, this American history. It's also often, not always, like a Jewish American history. Um, I also think about the like Lehman trilogy, which is a play that I saw last year and is about the Lehman brothers of the bank, but they started out in kind of mercantile in Alabama. Um, and 
anyway, it's also a book that I really I recommend the story. But um, but just also thinking about how that sense of touch, like in a store, is kind of gone, um, and just how that's such part of the fabric of urban life. Um, you know, you could go back to sort of like the arcades of Benjamin, which was, you know, more about looking and walking, but there's a sensorial place. And so that kind of also brought me to um, read it. Am I frozen? That also brought me to sort of like this text by Susan Buckmorse about um, anesthetics, which actually we read uh, because of my colleague, Steve Locke, in a seminar that I co-taught this semester. And while I'm working on this show and I'm, and I'm reading uh, Benjamin again with my students in a different class, and I'm just sort of like getting the store in my brain a lot. So I don't know if that exactly explains what your question or answers your question, but I guess going back to the idea of display and the idea of the 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 location of the gallery the public coming in the openness and all of these discussions that we've been having about why one would make work in that space and what specific work would go for that space um, so i'm thinking about all these things kind of swirling around i don't have like a thesis about it but this is what i'm working on um, yeah and I, I mean it, you it's <laughs> even I'm getting dizzy and I just, it's so exciting. And <laughs> the fact that you're, um, you're, you're, you are thinking about and drawing on these, these, this local history. And so for those of you who, who, who aren't familiar with it, Edgar J. Kaufman was the, um, uh, the sort of patriarch of this major department store called Kaufman's, which had um, its flagship store here in downtown Pittsburgh and then had several other locations. And, um, and resulted in a family fortune that um, uh, led to um, their collecting very avidly um, design and really architecture and, and eventually commissioning Frank Lloyd Wright to build the house Falling Water. Um, and, and in fact, uh, Kaufman Jr. Uh, went on to become a curator of architecture at MoMA at one point. But um, Sarah, maybe this is a good chance just to mention really briefly that another kind of um, branch to this is that um, you applied for and got a residency um, and uh, let me keep it on this last image sorry I keep jumping ahead but you applied for and got a residency at Falling Water and are um, thinking about it, again depending on <laughs> if and when we can all leave our homes and, and go places um, that you might make some work uh, at Falling Water that could somehow um, complement or filter into this exhibition. Yes, that's true. I'm really excited about that. I'm, uh, I've only, I don't know, I, I've only ever had an experience with a building, a Frank Lloyd Wright building. Like, I didn't really realize until I went into a Usonian house, the one that they have at Crystal Bridges, that I really deeply cared about architecture. Like, I really had like an emotional response. So um, the idea of being able to interface with another home it's not a usonian home obviously it's much more epic uh is is uh just really exciting and i think just to backtrack for one second to the idea of being dizzy because i'm like i am bringing a lot of things i think mm -hmm. one of the threads is um a sort of mashup of maybe the very deep sort of modernist mid-century uh, you know, 20th century uh, conditions and looking at them from the beginning of the 21st century, which is just a very generic way of saying like my generation, you know, so sort of like reaching back in my own personal history, I can find, uh, you know, Jewish immigrants who started a store and, and that whole a roller coaster, um, and then I can go all the way up to, you know, 21st century living in New York City, um, my own personal like relationship with, with the city and the architecture and the legacy of that 
and that's just like one lens of it but um and we should also mention you're you're originally from chicago which is yes no, is known for lots of great frank Lloyd wright houses yeah but i mean i i had heard of it maybe when i was a child I, I moved out of chicago when i was 17 and it wasn't a part of my life as a child but like um, but yes, it's true. The, the light, I, I learned about it after. So anyway, uh, Falling Water, the plan is, if it works out, um, to do a series of sort of Zoom lessons um, or the equivalent of Zoom lessons, like a simulation, um, video lessons from the house that will be sort of beamed into the, um, to the museum and on the website of the museum. And so that's still being worked out. Am I frozen? Um, that's still being worked out, but I think there's just such a shift um, that's happened in the past year. I mean, I've spent the most of my time in the past eight months exactly like this, looking at slides, talking to people on Zoom. Um, I, I've just interfaced a lot, I'm sure everyone has, but especially in a teaching environment, teaching and learning environment. Um, so it's it's naturally, uh, you know, influencing my work. Um, so I don't know if any of this sounds organized or disorganized or anything. Well, I think it sounds good. And I, I'm just kind of filling in some gaps. So for, um, uh, you mentioned your teaching, you are currently a teacher, you are a head of the undergraduate uh, photography program at Pratt, um, working on Wait, what did I say? Sorry. Oh, I'm doing, I, I, I run the grad program in oh, photography. Grad program. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. Don't give me too much credit though. Okay. Well, but you are, you are an educator and I think that's significant, but let's move on and talk. I, I know that this is a, a kind of a brand new test um, and um, uh, you know, everyone's probably noticing this image, the, which we're all familiar with as like a power up button. But actually one of the things that we've been talking a lot about um, Sarah is um, armatures and the and mounts and the things that um, museums build to hold artworks up, um, which are specifically intended to disappear. Um, you know, the if you notice a mount, then we haven't done our job. The the idea is that you look at the artwork. Um, and again, I think um, as you are blurring the lines between different media and um, kind of questioning where does the artwork stop and real life start. Um, you, you've um, you, you've talked a lot about this idea again of thinking about care or support, um, thinking about support specifically, and maybe you can talk about um, this image and how you're sort of thinking about mount making. Yeah, so um, that's a I'd say it's about 14 inches, maybe a little smaller diameter um, circle of. Uh, opaline glass that's sort of milky. It almost is glass that looks like plastic, which is one of the reasons I like it. Um, it's, you know, translucent. Um, and yeah, it's an image of a button in the center. And then it's a very, very crude museum mount that I made at the beginning of the year. Um, and it's basically like a brass armature that like holds onto it um, and then sticks in the wall. And so thinking about this for the specifically for the museum and also I've just been thinking about these mounts um, for a while, uh, but I didn't really know how I was gonna incorporate them. But yeah, as Dan said, they're the, the professional credo of a mount maker is to basically make it disappear, which is what so much labor in our world and specifically in the art world in the museum is about being made to disappear um or being invisible and um so there's part of it that's going to be about making that visible so under normal circumstances uh this brass would be painted out so that it sort of chameleon uh chameleoned itself into the wall or into the piece um and you've probably noticed this before if you've gone to a museum that had like coins or bowls or any kind of design objects. Um, they're usually on like a deck, uh, you know, or the, the Met has, you know, incredible mounts. And they're 
so detailed in the way that they disappear and basically mm -hmm. make the piece appear like it magically exists. Um, and I think with my work in general, I'm really interested in this idea of showing the work, um, which is another reason why I like glass because it, it goes together, but you can always, if there's ever a seam, a cut, or if anything was ever put together by two pieces instead of one, you can always see the line. It's like a hairline um, fracture and it, it gives a shadow um, sometimes even more than you can actually see on the piece. And I really like showing that. And I think it's, I, I mean, again, there's so much, so many things to unpack here and so many layers, but Pittsburgh, as some of you might know, also has a very long tradition of glass making um, and PPG glass is still headquartered here. Um, and so that, that industry, I mean, it, it's, it is fascinating to think about this industry that literally, literally produces things that we are tended not to see, um, but that might reflect back at us sometimes too. Um, so um, making, you know, the labor or the work of others visible is, um, is something that, I think is really significant um, set of works as another element of what we're thinking about for the exhibition. And then want to um, make sure we open it up for questions or comments. Um, and, you know, I, I see some people have been putting things in the chat. Feel free to put, put more things in the chat. And even if we don't answer it right away, uh, I think Lori can help us um, uh, get back to it. But um, what we're looking at here is an installation at your um, from your gallery is uh, Chicago, right? This is a document. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yes. And um, these are um, maybe a bit more explicitly uh, glass objects. Um, and here's another kind of process view uh, in your studio. Um, but these are again, these kinds of sleeves or these cradles that are holding floral elements in this case. And we have um, talked a lot about um, bringing again, another sensory um, experience into the galleries as, as potentially um, having a botanical element uh, installed in the exhibition and, and featured as a part of the artwork. And, I think the last image here just gives you a close up at tactility of the glass and that you were mentioning the kind of transmutation from liquid to solid and it feels like right now it's in transition. Uh, and, and of course the flowers are too, right? And flowers have a long tradition in the history of art as these um, objects of beauty, but also objects that represent mortality and even death. Um, so, you know, can you talk a little bit about the kinds of, and you, you, you've used, vegetables and other things in the past. Talk a little bit about what it's like to, or why you want to bring in these um, organic elements. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little self-conscious that this show seems like an absolute mess from this band. <laughs> but, um, but I think that that's maybe, you know, that's what we came to talk about, the sort of process of it. And um, and I'm, I'm cool with that. But, uh, but yes, I think that, I guess, there was this idea of um, having a living and dying element in it. And I think I'm also, I'm, I'm really interested in these works, but I'm still perplexed myself because they're not, there's no image involved. <laughs> and so I confused myself when I made them and I confused myself when I cared about them um, and wanted to start incorporating them. But basically the idea is, yeah, that it's, it's a, it's a moment where real life, of course, a representation of real life, an allegory for real life, but is coming into the art object. And, and also, I think the idea of a little bit of difficulty, um, you know, I think there's so much beauty in the color and so much easy on the eyes and so much seduction about all of that stuff. And then when there's like, again, getting back to this idea of the, the labor interaction, um, it's a really easy way to also have the suggestion of interaction without actually being an interactive installation, which is just not something I do. So it, it suggests, it points to interaction. It points to temporality, obviously in a classic, you know, painting allegorical way. Um, and yeah, so I think that, you know, in a way, 
it just kind of changes the time, the time frame. It points outside the museum. Um, and like you were saying, it points to sort of life and death in a way. And um, I'm also just really open for trying something that I'm confused by. Um, because I think that if it's something that is sort of has a tension for me that hopefully it will have attention for people that interact with it in a way that, you know, has meaning or makes meaning or makes questions. So I haven't looked at the chat. Oh, we can't hear you, Dan. I think that's a that's a great place to stop looking at images, actually, because, um, you know, I remember a quote from from the photographer Sally Mann, who said um, uh, uh, art or photography should be ambiguous. If it's not ambiguous, don't don't bother making it. And um, and I think, you know, as you're just referring to it, you know, the, there are a lot your work and uh, is is asking a lot of questions and not necessarily giving answers. Um, and um, and that's what a lot of contemporary art does, I think. And oftentimes it falls to the museum or the curator to um, try to step in and act as an interlocutor and, and provide interpretation that might help our audiences understand that. Um, and I think, you know, that we have to walk this line between wanting to, um, you know, tell people what's going on, but also give them the opportunity to formulate their own ideas and their own relationships to these objects. Um, and I think um, the the messiness or the chaos that you're referring to is, is a reflection of that. You know, we, you know, for those of you who, who aren't in the arts or who, who aren't working in, in museums or, or making your own work, um, I think, you know, the idea that, that as a curator, I just pick pictures and stick them in a frame and they go on the wall and then we move on to the next. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm equally as challenged by this work and, um, and there are things that, that I don't understand. And, um, and sometimes I feel like I can ask you, I can't. I just, for and, and that has to be okay. Um, but we did, uh, since we have about 10 minutes left here, um, we can take a question here from um, Kenneth who says, um, we, we, talk, uh, we talked about the um, touching the glass of our phones and the way that that influenced this work. Um, was there pre-COVID work that viewers, I think what, he's asking, was there pre-COVID work that you made where people touched things? Not really, not, not in my work. Um, but I think you can suggest touch without actually inviting touch. Yeah. I mean, who knows what people do when you're not around, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Is that, I, I, I mean, I want to, I really want to pull on that one a little bit further, um, Sarah. Is it, is it the um, opacity of the glass that suggests, I mean, I'm curious about like materials and visuals and, and of certainly of the testing, the testers themselves. I mean, how, how do you think that, um, that, that suggestion happens um, in your work? Well, yeah, I mean, in those tester works, it's, it, I mean, there probably are other ways, but the way I think about it is that you just, you just immediately know that that's a thing that people are putting their finger, that it's like meant to be touched, almost like a button, but it's not a button. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's obviously always interaction with the work. You know, I think like all artworks are interactive in some way, but there's also artworks that are like truly interactive. That's not what I'm making that I know of. And I, but I think, um, I mean, another way that you're um, providing a level of interaction as, as you've already alluded to a little bit is, is with, uh, with some of your personal background and experience and and you mentioned it a little bit but um, again I think you know it, it's easy to think about curators or artists as as kind of monolithic I guess in a way and um, and at heart 
you know, uh, we're still people with, with our own, you know, interests and predilections and tastes and experiences. And, um, and I think it's amazing that you're, you know, um, that you shared with me a little bit about, you know, your family history and some of the mercantile history there. And, um, you know, it, 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 it provides really interesting texture to, to what we see. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I'm not always really comfortable with sharing all that stuff. Um, and I don't really think that my biography is the most interesting thing about me as an artist. <laughs> um, no artist does, but that's, uh, meanwhile, but that's what we actually are. Wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, but are there other questions as we, as we dwindle the sands through the hourglass? We've got about eight minutes left, but nothing else has come in. I don't know. What is there anything else that? Oh, but I know one thing we didn't talk about is um, programming. Some things that we've talked about doing that, again, go beyond just the gallery. Um, and um, we have um, some um, docent groups and team groups that will certainly want to engage um, with Sarah um, when, when hopefully when she can be here. Um, we've also talked about a, um, uh, an actual workshop that could happen at a place called the Pittsburgh Glass Center um, where um, people could see the actual process of how some of these photographs get made um, in glass. Um, and again, you know, um, for, for, for the museum, I think it's, um, it's really important that we think through online uh, uh, events. Um, what, how do you think about when you're like, obviously, programming not some work? Um, I can't really, I, I'm losing you. I don't know if other What do you look are. for when you go to, oh, sorry. Oh. I was saying, what do you look for when you go to, like, when you're, when you're interested in a museum program or when you're, you know, looking to learn more about art that you're seeing in a, in a, on the walls of a gallery? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I'm interested in uh, programming at museums. And honestly, it usually comes down to whether I have the energy to attend virtually or otherwise. But, um, but usually it's something I'm that I, I mean, that's the thing that's weird about it, I guess. I don't know. For me, mm, it's probably like I have some small relationship with the topic, with the artists, if there's authors involved, if there's a subject involved. So um, it usually wouldn't be something totally random that I would engage with. But I don't know. Some people probably do just, you know, probably I think a lot of times it's like that's the day people go to the museum and they look at the sheet that's, I don't know if they're printed anymore. Or it's a screen where it shows like, oh, two o'clock, there's going to be a this and a that. Um, I think, you know, some of the museum programming is so excellent and it's really been great for COVID to be able to zoom all over the globe and participate and listen to people talk about things. So um, I actually think the most amazing thing is the, um, the you know, what's going to happen again, post COVID, post COVID it's like post internet, post modern. It's like, it's gonna, we're gonna be dragging COVID with us in the post. Um, and, you know, just the, the fact that you can smash locations and there's obviously a lot lost but by not being able to meet in person, but it is pretty incredible to be able to like, go to a talk in LA, go to a talk in London, go to a talk in Pittsburgh, you know, or a, some, or in Philadelphia, you know? So I don't know, I think, I think that's the biggest thing just to see as long as we don't tire ourselves out, you know? Um, but I do see there's a lot of questions. Yeah, some now questions have started coming in um, really quick about the title for the show. Um, because this is really just a serial show that we do, it will just be Forum 85, uh, Sarah Greenberg Rafferty. Um, uh, a question here about, um, uh, scale, which uh, is interesting. How do you think about scale, um, uh, particularly, you know, the, you know, relationship between different works? Yeah, I mean, those testers are printed at like much bigger scale than, than real life. But um, because I think of them as like, 
sort of images more than objects um, in this case. But uh, yeah, scale is really important to me. And in general, I usually stick to, with imagery, I usually stick to between 90 and 110% scale of anything, um, you know, right around quote unquote life size. Um, so there's other works that I'm making for the show where there's imagery on panels and that's almost always like a hundred percent scale with the imagery. Um, and yeah, I want things to become big by being real, not by being enlarged, if that makes sense. Yeah. Maybe time for one last question here from my dad. He says, he says, what art do you display in your home? What do you, what, what do you live with? For me what, or for you? No, that's, for me, he <laughs> knows what I have. <laughs> um, well, I am not the curator of my home. My uh, husband is the curator of my home. So I do have a lot of art that is um, gifted or traded from other artists, such as David Kennedy Cutler, Ethan Greenbaum. <laughs> um, I, what about, what about like, uh, like, I can't hear you. What do you live with? Like, do you just have magazines or else? What, you know? Oh, I didn't really hear the whole thing, but I mean, <laughs> so I, it's a really long story, but the long story short is that I had flooding in this room that I'm sitting in now. So that's why I have nothing up because it got, it got fixed right before the pandemic. And then we rushed back into our apartment, but like, from where I'm sitting right now, I'm in my apartment actually. Normally there's art here and I can see like a photograph of um, <laughs> Martin Short from Inner Space signed by Joe Dante, prized possession here. And then I can see over there a Polaroid by Eileen Quinlan. And then I see over there a picture of John McEnroe and Bjorn Borg. Um, and that's what I can see around here because most of my, our art is away um, because of this flood situation that we had. But um, normally it's my contemporaries. And then there's a few no, but I, So I guess, I, yeah. well, I was also interested just like, do you have magazines laying around? Like, do you look at, yeah. at pictures, all, like stuff all the time? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess I have, I guess I have magazines. I'm like looking at, I grabbed a stack of books um, again, this is a mixture of my stuff and my husband's stuff, but to put the computer on and there's like <laughs> a music direct catalog, Mungo Thompson's mail catalog, which is so cool. It's, um, it's great. Do you, you know that one? Yeah, it's, it, that's great. Yeah. It's, I want to show people cause it's too good. <laughs> um, it's based on the Uline catalog. Yeah. And it's all the mail. <laughs> Anyway, great artist book. Two issues of Racket Magazine, Moira Davies, I Confess, and A New Yorker and Barack Obama's uh, <laughs> biography. I love it. I love it's it. It's just well, I'm real. on top of uh, I'm on top of a box of scattergories. So Oh, that sounds good. That sounds really fun. <laughs> and I know we're right up at eight o'clock here. Yeah. So um we probably should wrap it up, but um, thank you, Sarah, so much for for taking the time to to talk with me and to talk, share all of this information with our um, uh, with the audience. Thank you again to Lori and to Sarah and everyone at PPAC for for the invitation, and thanks to all of you for joining. Um, I'm I'm going to sign off unless there's something else that needs to be said, and I just hope all of you uh, remain safe and healthy, and best wishes for uh, the holiday.